All right, thanks. Yeah, the Port Angeles um, Festival should be really good. I'm going to give a talk on psilocybe there. Uh, but those are just little brown mushrooms. So I really like giving talks like this better. Um, one thing about my talks is that they're really best when people kind of like ask questions right during my talk. So feel free to interrupt me mid-sentence. You can try raising your hand, but I probably won't see you. So it's best just to start talking when I'm talking. And um, like, don't don't be shy. Really, that makes my talks a lot better when people like, you know, give me some feedback or ask about something. We'll go on some crazy tangent. Uh, but this year, I was in Ecuador for five weeks. So it was the whole month of March and a little bit of April. And I first went to Ecuador in 2020, right at the beginning of the pandemic. And that was really cool. So this time it went back for longer. Why? And to look for mushrooms. Same reason I go everywhere. Um, so this is what Ecuador looks like. And where I was, was at about a thousand meters elevation. And so it is not super tropical, but it's also not the high elevation. It's kind of in the middle, which is like a really nice place to be. The mushroom diversity is really good there. Um, the people there are super nice. They speak Spanish much more slowly than they do in Mexico. And so it's a lot easier to understand them. Um, also, I was surprised that the currency is the U.S. dollar. So you just get regular dollars out of the ATM machine and like, Everything you get is a dollar, a big bag of passion fruit or whatever. Um, we stayed at this place called Finca Hymatlos, which you can kind of see over here. And that is a eco resort. So uh, my friend Furhat built it way out in the jungle. And it's a really nice place, kind of like a high end hotel right, uh, right out in the middle of the jungle. They got like miles of habitat, uh, just like hiking trails there and all sorts of cool stuff. And the plants. That they were like really nice, like about mid seventies, most days and kind of like high fifties at night. And then the rain came in most afternoons. So we would kind of like uh, start hunt, you know, hiking around 10 a.m. And then the rains would come about three. And um, then we would just go back and like work on our photos or whatever. And then the rains would usually stop at like five or so. So then we could do a bunch of night hiking. And so, um, yeah, there are beautiful temperatures. If you go like really low elevation in Ecuador, that's where everything is out to get you. So there's like all these ticks and chiggers and dangerous snakes and it's super hot all the time and there's less mushrooms down there. And then if you go really high, like Quito is like 3000 meters elevation. So that's like 9,000 feet. It's really cold up there. It's like San Francisco or colder. Um, so this, these middle elevations are really like the most pleasant places. To go, uh, to go. Um, the place that I stayed was called Finca Jaimatlos. So if you want to go to Ecuador and stay somewhere cool, uh, where the owner is like he's amazing at mushroom identification. If you're on Facebook at all, you've probably seen Furhat identify a bunch of your mushrooms. Um, really cool place to go. This thing is Heliconia delisana, and this is a very rare Heliconia. There's a lot of common Heliconias, but like the center of diversity for Heliconias in, in Ecuador. So they're just like beautiful flowers like this um, could not be more crimson red. And then, you know, I don't know much about plants. So whenever I see a plant, I just take pictures of it, put, up, put it up on iNaturalist and let the botanist figure it out. And this one has very few observations. So it's really only been seen a few times. Uh, there's like little discoveries like this. They're like super common. A lot of the plants I photographed, it was like the only observation on iNaturalist. This hygrosophy was bright green, really cool little thing. Um, so around here, we have the parrot wax caps, which are kind of green, but this was like iridescent fluorescent green. And like that one a lot. And then there's a lot of cordyceps type things. Um, pretty much every day in Ecuador, we found different cordyceps. And we'll see a bunch of them in the talk, but this is a moth and it's got some sort of maybe acanthomyces type of thing. Um, Can you explain what cordyceps is? Yeah, so the cordyceps uh, is a genus of mushrooms that uh, eat other insects. And so the, you got all different colors and shapes and sizes, but the cordyceps are very picky. So they're very picky about which insect that they're on. So different insects have different cordyceps. And the cordyceps 
fungus interacts with the insects in very complicated ways. So they tend to have really interesting chemicals. Um, so they have a lot more medicinal potential than most just average mushrooms because they're interacting with the insects and the insects are you know, not super distantly related to all the other you know, mammals and everything. So cordyceps have crazy chemicals, crazy colors and crazy forms and they're really fun to see. There's a few around here, but you know, around here, it's like you, you would maybe see one cordyceps every decade, whereas um, you know, in Ecuador, it's like every day. Did, is there cordyceps militaris in that area? I definitely found some stuff that looked to me like militaris. Um, whether it's actually militaris, we'll find out when all the DNA sequence results okay. come in. Do you know if there's any breeders, uh, like terrestrial fungi or anything like that, that is trying to... Uh, produce like a uh, liquid culture or anything from Ecuador? Uh, not that I know of. I know one guy in Mexico named Robert Kelly who's cultivating a lot of really interesting cordyceps that he finds. And um, he said that he grew one cordyceps and he ate it and he's, he kind of got kind of sick and felt really off for a couple of days. So I think <laughs> cordyceps have so many crazy chemicals in them that it's maybe not a good idea to experiment with unknown ones. Why do they call them militaris? Oh, like that's a really good question. Um, I'd have to look up and see who published that and find the original species description. And sometimes they put, you know, in the entomology section, why, you know, why they called it that. But yeah, I don't know. I Now I'm, now I'm curious too. <laughs> We have a question up front, yeah. Okay, cool. So there are a lot of Mycena in Ecuador and um, I really love Mycena. They are, you know, just like, they're so diverse. They're beautiful in person. They're beautiful under the microscope. There's all sorts of different colors. Um, but this one is Mycena spinosima. And so it has these spikes on the top, um, just a really cool looking thing. And a lot of these also, they have these kind of pegs on the stem and these things are beautiful um, in the microscope as well. And then there's all sorts of other things. Um, this is some sort of, I think this one was in the genus Anolis. So in Anoli, um, just really cool looking thing. It's really well camouflaged, but it was right in the middle of the trail. So I think he thought that he was really hidden but we were actually all just like, wow, I'm taking pictures of it. Um, here's another famous plant from the Ecuador. This is the ayahuasca vine. So this vine, they mix with another plant that we actually found just a couple feet from here. And it's the hallucinogenic uh, brew that they make in Ecuador. And the, um, the DMT in this hallucinogenic plant is just like one molecule away from the psilocin and psilocybin mushrooms. So it's like a botanical equivalent of that. Uh, but these vines are huge and uh, relatively common in the jungle there. Um, I was uh, lucky enough to have some really good botanists with me that were along on this trip. And they were able to identify a lot of the plants and they immediately were like, like, wow, that's the same one I have in my bath, growing in my bathroom at home. The militarist means soldier or warrior. Ah, uh, I could see that, yeah. It's kind of like an orange plume thing. And it takes over an animal like a warrior. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. And um, we did a lot of hiking at night, and the things that come out at night are awesome. You'll see a bunch of them kind of scattered throughout this. Um, but this guy is Jordan Jacobs. He's really cool. He lives in Portland, and he um, he does a lot of chemistry stuff. Uh, but we found this massive snail, and it's just. <laughs> <laughs> really cool looking thing. Yeah, they're really big. This one is native and um, apparently it's edible. We didn't we just let it go. But yeah, we just found it crawling around the forest floor. And we also found a lot of glowing uh, mushrooms that glow in the dark. So this is a Pinellas. And you know what we do is just like when the sun goes down after dinner, we'll just start walking around the trails with no lights at all, um, which is really dangerous because the forest really comes alive at night. It's not like the forest here, like around Washington, I was walking around in the, in, in, the, in the dark last night and it's really just the same as the day, except that there's no light. In uh, Ecuador, all of a sudden the forest comes alive and there are a million things 
uh, moving. You can hear them everywhere. That's when all the snakes come out. Um, there's birds that are like flying through like crazy. It's um, it is really interesting just to walk around at night with like uh, with somebody who really knows these things and um, just learn about all the different well, things. The there, Alan? How many poisonous snakes? Yeah, how many have you seen? Uh, I only saw one truly poisonous snake, and I got some pictures of it later on. Um, but usually when I go to a place, what I'll do is I'll go into iNaturalist, and I'll, like, draw a box that's, like, 50 miles around where I am. And I'll put, like, how many snakes, and it'll say, like, 23 species of snakes. Um, or you can just put in, like, plants and get, like, have it draw up, like, a quick field guide to, like, any of the plants or mushrooms in an area. Um, so, yeah, there's uh, a bunch of different poisonous snakes, but most of them are not too bad. But... One of them, um, one of them, I got, I got some pictures in a little bit. Is that how brightly they glow or is that a long exposure? This is long exposure. So this is a little pinellus that was growing on bamboo. And we found it just by walking through the woods at night um, with no light at all. After about three, three or four minutes, your eyes adjust to the dark and you start seeing patches of glowing things all over the place. Mm -hmm. A lot of it's just mycelium, so there'll be glowing leaves. But then you can have like 10,000 leaves in your field of view, all of them glowing. So it's almost like the ocean floor or something. It's really spectacular. But then occasionally you find actual mushrooms. And so there's a bunch of different strategies we use to kind of collect these things and photograph them. But this was a plain old long exposure. So um, usually I'll take like one picture for like 10 seconds at the really high ISO. And that'll help me gauge. And I'll take another picture at like 800 ISO for about three minutes, and I'll get something like this with much less noise than I get with the really high ISO. So these are just little things. Uh, the kind of they're tough like polypores, but they have a consistent. Um, they're closely related to Mycena. So you know most of the glowing mushrooms are in the genus Mycena, and these could be in that genus depending on how big you want to make Mycena. These ones are really cool. Um, this is another glowing Mycena, and this one glows really brightly. So I found this at about midnight, and so this photo here is photo snacked, where I combine about 40 pictures. That's why it's like really uh, clear and in focus. But then I also photo stacked the one that I did um, at night or just in, in the dark. And so I did 30 second exposure at like ISO 400, and then open up the aperture all the way, and then it took like 40 pictures. So this, it took like 20 minutes for me to take this picture. So I just started the camera and then walked away without any light. But you get like really good detail on this. Like I can just like zoom in on any of these things and you can like really see um, the glowing. And these are very bright. Like you don't have to wait very long. Like, you know, when you have your, you're blinded by the flashlight, you turn off the flashlight and within just a couple seconds, you can see these because they're really bright. Some of the other ones, you got to wait a few minutes before you can see them. I'm um, pretty sure this is a new species of Mycena. I talked to all the Mycena experts from Brazil and around there. Is it and kind of like a glow stick where when you put a flashlight on it and then turn it off, it glows brighter? No, it's not. So um, what you're talking about is phosphorescence, and that's when you shine light on something and then it keeps glowing for a while. And there's no phosphorescent mushrooms or plants or animals, but there's like phosphorescent rocks where you like shine your black light on the rock and it glows for a few seconds, or phosphorescent t-shirts are real popular. But these are glowing all the time. They're glowing all day, all night, same, same like brightness. Is there a no, there isn't. My guess is because they're attracting insects. Because if you're in the middle of the night, the, you know, the forest is alive. And, you know, mushroom spores don't usually go very far. So if you can get some kind of insect to bring the spores of mycelium around. Um, interestingly, all the glowing mushrooms are wood lovers. So maybe it's like beetles kind of like burrow into the next tree and, and bring it. But then it also takes a oxygen molecule to make a photon. And so some people think they're like getting rid of um, the, like these free radicals or kind of like, like an antioxidant. Uh, it could be a lot of things. Also, not everything in nature really has a reason. Um, I was at, or a lot of times the reason is there, but it's like not obvious to us. I was at the PSMS meeting uh, a couple of days ago, and Steve Trudell was there, and somebody asked, like, why the deadly mushrooms are deadly, and he says that there may not be a reason, but a lot of these chemicals that are in mushrooms, they're actually there because they are, uh, most of the mushroom is, like, underground in the mycelium all the time, and so a lot of these chemicals are, are you know, 
used for the chemical warfare underground in the mycelium. And it's just kind of random that the mushroom happens to have that chemical too, but a lot of the chemicals don't necessarily do anything in the mushroom, but they do something underground in the mycelium where the mushroom is battling out, it out all the time. That might be the case for like psilocybin or all sorts of different things. Alan, you said that photo uh, previously took 40 minutes. Yeah, I think it was like 20 minutes, yeah. So why, why wouldn't there be all kinds of insects coming into the frame? Well, there's no light. So if an insect came, it would just be a little bit of shadow and they, you know, the insect would have to just like go there and stay there um, for a long time, and they just didn't happen to. But but yeah, there was certainly were, there were not a hot bed of insects. Like you know, they they probably attract insects a little bit, but they weren't like going crazy over them or anything. It was also really good uh, insects in Ecuador. Um, like this one here is huge and crazy. And then this is a katydid that um, disguises itself as a leaf. Really cool looking thing. And then this one here is Psilocybe cerulescens. And so this is one of the landslide mushrooms, um, a pretty potent psychoactive mushroom. And when I found this, we were with a native tribe called the Sachawasi. And I asked them if they knew this mushroom and they said, yes, we, we pick it and we wrap it in a banana leaf and cook it over the fire and eat it for dinner. Um, so I think maybe they didn't actually know the mushroom because um, psilocybin is pretty heat stable. And if you were to cook this and eat it for dinner, you'd have a big surprise. <laughs> but this is one of the tribes that's famous for doing the ayahuasca ceremonies, but they also do mushroom ceremonies and they were buying psilocybe cubensis that was cultivated for the ceremonies. So they were happy to learn that they had some native psilocybin mushrooms that were growing right on the edge of the village. I like stuff like this. This could be a campanella, um, but these anastomosing gills with the intervenous gills are just really cool looking. Um, and this is a little glass frog. This is a, a frog, a genus of frogs that only occurs in caves. Um, so we got invited on this cave expedition and it was really cool because there was like 20 scientists and they were all studying different aspects of the caves. So they invited us along to study the mushrooms in the cave. Uh, but we took pictures of the other stuff that was there too. This is the interesting mushroom that they brought us here for. And this, I'm not sure what it is, but we collected it. We'll get DNA sequence data eventually. Uh, but this grows on bat guano and it's probably something in the cordyceps family. It starts out white and then kind of turns orange as it gets a little bit more mature. Really unusual thing. And then here's another one we found in the cave. Um, this grows on a palm seed. So it's just the palm seed rolled into the cave, but this is related to penicillium, uh, but it makes these you know, big tentacles that make tons of green mold spores. And then in ultraviolet light, it looks really cool. It's like uh, these droplets that were on there that were barely visible um, are extremely fluorescent. Uh, we were actually looking at the Phaelus swinesii today, the Dyer's polyform. We saw something similar, very, very brightly fluorescent um, droplets on the underside. That's the fungal metabolites. And then there's a lot of slime molds in Ecuador too. This one is one of my favorites. It's a Ceratio mixa, but you know, it has this stem that looks like it's made of glass and it's just a you know, wild, unusual type of thing. And these just turn to slime as soon as you touch them. Here's a different Ceratio mix, uh, another really pretty thing. Slime molds are always good macro photography subjects. Here is Claveria schaeferi. Um, although Clovaria schaeferi is described from Germany, it's the best name we have, but it's definitely not really Clovaria schaeferi. Almost certainly doesn't have a name yet. Uh, turns out most of the fungi in Ecuador don't have names yet. Um, also, most of the fungi in Washington don't have names yet either. There's a, a lot of work to do naming mushrooms. Uh, this is Kukaina. And then here's another one of the cordyceps. This is Ophiocordyceps melanthone. And so it grows on this big melanthona beetle, this thing here, it's this massive beetle, a couple inches long, and it makes these big stroma, it makes the spores on the top. And if you like zoom in and you look real close, you can see all of these 
Uh, the dots are parathesia, so these are flask-shaped cells that emit spores. And um, that's how you can kind of tell that it's a cordyceps and not some kind of, you know, earth tongue or something like that. Harvest them for um, Solomon markets. Um, cordyceps yet? No, they don't. You know, a lot of them are probably toxic. There's huge amount of cordyceps. You know, huge number of species. Some of them are probably medicinal, but. Um, you know, it's possible some of the remote tribes use them medicinally, but for most people just don't know what chemistry that they have. And so, um, but they are pretty easy to grow. So you could just take one of these things, throw it on agar and, you know, fire up a culture and you could definitely grow and produce whatever chemical they're producing. But testing for unknown toxins is pretty difficult because uh, this human body is just so complicated. This cordyceps is pretty cool. Yep. Bringing something from Ecuador and then firing it up on an auger here, what are the chances it's going to be decided likes living here and it's kind of screw things up? Oh, very low. I think um, things in Ecuador do not tend to do well here. They it's a very high humidity environment and it's very uh, it's it's very warm. So they would not like our winters here and they wouldn't know what to do with the bugs here. So if you took a lot of plants from Ecuador and you planted them here, it's possible some of them could take over and become invasive, but the, the fungi, probably not. Yep. I don't see how you could get through customs with those, through agriculture. Um, well, when you're bringing mushrooms back from foreign countries, as long as there's no dirt or insect, um, you, you're allowed to bring dried mushrooms into the country. So that's one of the things that you are allowed to bring back. You're not allowed to bring back you know, leaves, plants, seeds. Um, you know, botanists do it all the time and they usually like declare it and show it to the customs guys and the customs guys make sure there's no bugs. Um, but mushrooms are actually easier, uh, but you would also need permits to get the mushrooms out of Ecuador. So um, what we did is we collected everything under a permit that our scientist friends have. And then we left all of the collections in Ecuador and they're going to the herbarium in Quito where they can study them and they'll be preserved forever and we can do all the DNA sequencing and everything. Um, so we didn't try to bring anything back. Um, but if you were to bring something back, it would be uh, more of a problem leaving than getting back into this country. This one is cool. This is Ophiocordyceps nidus, a new species described just a couple of years ago and it grows on trapdoor spiders. So down here, this is the spider and then up here, this is the trap door. So it's this round door that the spider opens and closes. Um, and then the cordyceps is just fruiting out of its nest. Is, so when he opens the trap door, it just kind of flops or is that after he's expired? You know, I just found him because I found the cordyceps growing out. So I didn't get to see the spiders in action, but I, it's gotta be something like they're hiding back there and they open the trap door to hunt and you know pull their prey in, something like that. Um, this one here is Ophiocordyceps curculianum, and this one is growing on weevils. So if we zoom in, we can see this weevil here with this really long snout that they use to feed on the plants. And then up at the top, it makes where it makes its spores, and it's just bright, bright red. So this I found on the underside of leaves. And so I find stuff like this just by walking through the forest and whenever I see a plant, uh, especially a, a leaf that looks like it's been bitten by insects quite a bit. I flip it over and just look for cordyceps on the bottom of the leaf. And that's where you find a lot of them. So here's another one. I forget what this is, but the um, a lot of the bug experts on iNaturalist were arguing over what it could be. Um, really cool thing, though, is that, you know, mimicking something for sure. Yeah, and just right. stuff like this is just so, um, you know, there's so much of it. Like, if you went there for insects, you would find thousands and thousands of them, pretty much every, anything you look for. Looks this, like it's been yeah, maybe. <laughs> Here's another one. Um, and this, this plant ended up being really rare, too. So a bunch of these rare plants, you know, I, I spent like 10 seconds photographing them, and then now I have like the best picture of these plants that exist. So, you know, it's so pretty tempting to go back down there and just focus on plants and flowers. <clears throat> but um, the mushrooms have been really cool too. This one is Entoloma dragonosporum. And there are a lot of entolomas in Ecuador. 
Um, they're all from this group called cubospore. So they have cubicle shaped spores that look like a salt, uh, look like grains of salt. Here's some Favalachia. So these are Mycena relatives and they are very tiny. Uh, they might be in Mycena one day. Uh, but then there's a lot of really cool moths and flies and geckos. Um, this one here has really nice pattern. There's huge iguanas that are native. Um, this one here is called a gibelula, and gibelulas grow on spiders. So this was another thing that we found on the underside of a leaf, and you can see the spider at the base, and then these you know, stroma come out of it and release the spores and try to land on infect other spiders. Um, this thing was really tiny; it was about an inch tall. The butterflies are really good. This is one of the glass wing butterflies, so genus Greta. And this particular Greta is pretty rare, um, but you can like see through the wings. So they're, they're really cool to photograph, but they're really flighty. So it's really difficult. You see them flying around all the time. You don't see them sit still for very, oft very often. And this thing is pretty cool. This is a Gloeocephala. Gloeocephala are, um, these little things, the, whole, the big stem here is like the, the, the vein of a leaf, but they have these cystidia that stick out from the edges and you can kind of see your friends or the forest floor and the, in the lens that's created by the droplet. Um, so really, really fun things to photograph. Here's another one, uh, Gloeocephala lutea, also really tiny. They're, they're, this one was about two millimeters tall, but super bright yellow. And here's some of the glowing leaves that, were, um, that I found. And so here you can see just the regular leaves. And you know, a lot of times we're hiking at night. In, th in this case, we, I just kind of stopped to photograph stuff and noticed there was glowing leaves all around me. And um, you know, when you take these pictures, you can see which mycelium it is that glows. And then we gather up all the glowing mycelium. Um, well, what I do like when I find stuff like this, I turn off all the lights gather up all the glowing leaves. And then after I have a big handful of glowing leaves, I turn the bright lights back on and then carefully sort through them and see if I can find any that have mushrooms coming out of them. And usually it's a little tiny mycena. Sometimes they're ridiculously tiny, like one millimeter tall. Here's all the people um, that came to, to the Ecuador trip. So I decided that as long as I was going to Ecuador, I would invite the whole internet and so that's what I did. We rented out um, the whole eco resort. And for a week, we just had, took all these people all over the jungle to look for mushrooms. And then we had, we had microscopes and uh, DNA sequencing stuff and talks and stuff like that. So it was a pretty cool Ecuador trip. If you want to go to Ecuador next year, just pay attention to my social media. We'll, we'll probably do it like next March or something. This is a Guzmania. Uh, it's a bromeliad pineapple family, or another really rare one. And here's a gyrodon. Um, this one is gyrodon monticola, which is ectomycorrhiza with alder. And so this one we found under these big uh, alder trees there. So not a lot of mycorrhizal mushrooms there, but there's a few. This is a daddy long legs, so a pileones. And this one has, um, this is bovaria. So it's in the cordyceps family, has, makes the spores on these interesting flask shaped cells. And oh, actually in this picture, you can see the spores flying through the air. So these white things here are the spores and they're really um, very long spores, kind of like long thread like spores. Hey, Alan. Yep. I'm curious with the cordyceps, how, what the ratio is of cordyceps that infect the insect and allow the insect to still carry on its daily functions versus incapacitating. Because the picture you showed of one spider, it looked like it was completely enclosed, like it couldn't do spidey stuff anymore. Yeah. So which ones are some of them taking advantage of what the insect is doing and others are just eating the insect? That's a really good question. And I don't know because when I find them, the insect is dead. And I don't know if it's been killed by the fungus or if it just died and the fungus was waiting for it to die and then took over. But, you know, they, um, the insect has to be fully colonized before it can fruit. So by the time you notice an actual cordyceps mushroom or even any mycelium, it's long been if, dead. If you're doing cultivation or cordyceps 
and you use like uh, larva, there you inject them with liquid culture while they're alive, and uh, it will kill them over time, and then it takes over the body. So it, it's, I believe it is active in them until it dies, and then it will take it over, and then you'll see it colonize it. Kind of like the last year. Yeah, uh, chat. <laughs> Wanted to know how many hours a day. I don't know. It's on the chat. How many hours a day are you out mushrooming? How many hours a day? Well, that really depends on how many hours a day I want to be at my computer. Um, and the reason for that is that when I go out, I try to get really nice pictures of everything. And it takes me as long as I spend out in the woods uh, later on the computer. So if I'm out in the mushroom hunting for eight hours, then I need eight hours of computer time to get all those photos processed and online. Um, and that's mostly because I use a technique called photo stacking. Um, and I can talk a little bit about more about that if I have time at the end, but it makes the photos turn out really good, but it's really time consuming. So I am out there um, a lot and, you know, I haven't been home in four months. So I just kind of mushroom hunt all the time and going to different mushroom events every weekend for the, the past four months. And um, it's been really nice, but I do wonder how my garden's doing at home. <laughs> <laughs> these are daddy long legs, so apiliones. They're huge. These things are bigger than my hand and they are super fluorescent. So this is in the ultraviolet light. And I always carry these ultraviolet lights here. And um, this light here, you can't really see it because nothing is fluorescent. Oh, there's something. It's actually super bright. So like shining this on like different uh, mushrooms and insects and plants gives you really interesting colors and it gives you some insight into the chemistry that's present there. Here's what the thing looks like um, in regular light. It's harmless, but it is pretty scary looking. So after the trip, we went to, um, to the herbarium in Quito. And a uh, really cool lady named Rosa runs the herbarium there. And we talked to her and wanted to see if we could get permits to collect and uh, get all of these mushrooms saved in the herbarium forever. And she said that she, could, she would be happy to help us out with the permits and we could use her permit. But in exchange, she wanted me to come to the herbarium and identify all of her psilocybe for her. <laughs> so after the trip, we went to the herbarium and they have like all sorts of, you know, boxes and boxes. And this is their psilocybe section. They had about 25 of them. So it's all like al alphabetical order in here. And you can see over here, here's some, uh, some of the psilocybe that they had. So like this one, it says Trefaria, but oh, it says, it's actually, it says like psilocybe cubensis. So this one is uh, the one that's really easy to cultivate and you see it at every Grateful Dead show. It is native to Africa and Asia, but um, came over to Ecuador with the cattle. So this is like the really boring psilocybe. When I see them, I just, I only photograph them if they're really beautiful. Usually I just kind of pass them by, but there's a lot of other really interesting psilocybe there. Um, like this one here, um, this one is psilocybe zapatocorum. And this is the strongest wild psilocybin mushroom in the world. It's about one third stronger than the psilocybe azurescence that grows on your coast here. Uh, yes, I did. I put some photos of this in this presentation just half an hour ago. So, um, so yeah, I'll show them to you. This is just the envelope, but um, this one was identified by Gaston Guzman, who is the world expert in psilocybe, a Mexican mycologist. And it's pretty cool because they wrote down where they found it, what kind of soil it was on. They said it was in a cloud forest. And then they give you the coordinates and the altitude and you know a little description collected in 2002. So they just take all these interesting mushrooms and save them forever for scientific study. So uh, what I did when I went there is I took just a couple milligrams of each of these psilocybe and put it on a microscope slide and uh, took photos of the spores and the little cells on the, on the gills called cystidia. And um, using that, I'm able to figure out which psilocybe it is. And some of them were kind of the boring species that are um, you know, invasive from Asia. And then some of them were the really cool species that are native. Um, there was a couple of them that I think are probably new species in that herbarium. So those definitely need further study. So I just like write down all these like you know, notes and put it into the packet along with the mushroom and then it gets saved forever. 
This is Rosa here. So that's the lady that runs the herbarium. And they have this, this really nice Leica microscope that I was able to use. Um, and then her students came in and I was able to teach the students how to identify psilocybe with the microscope. And they, they enjoyed that a lot. This guy here is Andy Vetter. He's really cool. His family is from Ecuador. And so um, he's the person who hooked us up with all of the scientists there. And so, um, you know, if it wasn't for him, it would have just been like a mushroom photography trip, but he was able to you know, um, get us connected with people that had permits to collect. So we were able to collect all the mushrooms and save them and um, connect us to all the academics. And so that was, that was really cool. Here's one called Entoloma styroforum. So it um, has this really nice spine on the top, but it's also really fluorescent. So found it at night in ultraviolet light. It is bright blue, a bright baby blue. Um, so very cool looking thing. And here's what a lot of the you know jungle looks like there. It's pretty hard to like walk like directly through it. So a lot of times we're kind of like walking along these waterways so we can get from one place to another. And really, really cool photo uh, flowers all over the place. And here's Jordan Jacobs. In this, uh, in this photo, he is photographing what he thinks is Psilocybe zapatocorum. And so he's taking a really good picture using photo stacking. And then after a few minutes, we realize it's actually Lacrimaria, uh, probably Lacrimaria hypertropicalis. Uh, but it's, a, it's another mushroom that looks almost the same, but it doesn't stain blue. And it's a lot more fragile when you break it. Here's a leaf hopper, really good colors. And then so many colorful mushrooms there. This one's Lepiota erythrostricta. And this was like growing right in the middle of the trail. Um, this one was described from Africa. So the one in Ecuador is almost certainly a new species. And there was also loss of this leucocoprinus. So this is a close relative to that leucocoprinus that comes up in everyone's flower pot. But this one is much bigger and um, has this brown spot in the center of the cap. So uh, this is one that was described from Brazil. It was like leucocoprinus brunio lutea. There's another leucocoprinus. And then here is a uh, lizard that was sitting on a stick and Furhat, who owned this place, said that the exact same lizard was on the exact same stick in the same place the day before. So it just sits there waiting for prey to come along and eats it. So very, I guess, good strategy for you know getting lots of prey without having to expend a lot of energy. Lots of really good waterfalls there. And lots of really cool praying mantises. This praying mantis was jet black and really thin. And here's a trichomopsis with the cool anastomos and gills. Um, there's a lot of really bright yellow trichomopsis there. And here's some more people that came in the trip. This is Douglas Smith. Um, he's a gallerina expert. Um, really cool guy from the Bay Area. And then um, here is Manuel. And Manuel is a, a, a poponoid expert. So whenever I see an I naturalist any kind of inky cap mushroom. If I don't know what it is, I tag him and he knows what all of them are. And then here's another rare psilocybe that is very difficult to find. This one is psilocybe moseri. So this is sort of like psilocybe zapatocorum, but psilocybe zapatocorum grows in the upper elevation quad forest. And then psilocybe moseri grows in lower elevation, like around a thousand meters. And it turns out that we made an iNaturalist project for our trip, and this um, this was the, the top observed mushroom in this iNaturalist project. So typically, Psilocybe moseri is extremely rare, and there's barely any photos of it on the internet. But during our trip, it was the most common mushroom we saw. And there were so many moths there. I love all of the moths. And the place we were staying had a permanent moth light. So it was like a big whiteboard and just had like lights that are on all the time. And so um, if you go into iNaturalist and you zoom in to where the moth light is and um, just count the number of species, there's like over 2000 species of moths in a 10 foot area. And there are professional moth photographers that come all over the world, just to hang out in front of this moth light. And you'll go there and there'll be easily 200 species right there on this whiteboard and come back an hour later and there's like a different 200 species. 
they are like all different shapes and colors and sizes. I think I'll make a moss of Ecuador calendar this year. Um, this one's really cool because it had like a silver lining on the back of it. It looked like it was like made of mercury or something. And then I, I like these green ones. There's a lot of different green ones. And I guess these are mostly like colors to confuse predators or convince predators that they're poisonous. Um, you know, the eyes definitely are supposed to scare predators. <laughs> uh, but just like every design you can imagine, uh, one day people are going to genetically en engineer these things to have like a Coca-Cola logo on the back of them, and that will be annoying. <laughs> This one I like because it's like dark indigo cobalt blue. And you know, a lot of these moths have like really fine antenna and stuff. That's their chemical sensor. Did you find also some caterpillars here? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, the these moths are photographed because they were attracted to light. So the caterpillars not so much attracted to light, but we see a few when we're out there. Um some of them are the really poisonous caterpillars with spikes all over them, where you touch them and they sting you. Um, this one I like because it has the gold fringe along the outside. Did the light attract a lot of other insects? Yes. In the same area? Yeah, the moths were the most photogenic. But yeah, there was um, all sorts of katydids and, um, you know, like bees and just like, yeah, there was a lot of uh, diversity. And uh, other insects, uh, I just had no idea what they were until I put them up on iNaturalist and the, and the insect experts weigh in. Um, this is one moth that is not attracted to light, so I just found it way out in the forest, um, just on the other side, underside of a leaf. But I kind of like these ones with the clear wings. And this is one of my favorites because it has a heart on the back. Yeah. Yeah, we see these things all the time and they always have perfect hearts. Yeah, and then these, they look like a stealth bomber or like some kind of falcon or something. So that's the side view. And here's the same thing from the back. Yeah, I could spend all day in front of, in front of that moth light. Uh, here's some more Mycena. This one is Mycena chlorozantha, the yellow powder on the cap. And this is the most Mycena chlorozantha I've ever seen in one place. And here is a Mycena from section Longisette. So section Longisette has these like really long kind of like hairs on the top of the cap. So they look really spiky. And then they have these cool basal discs here. So they always have that disc at the base of the stem. Here is a Mycena and the Mycena Pura group. Um, these glow in the dark and they always have these really cool uh, cross hatching uh, veins in the gills. Do you think about any edibles? You know, there's not that many edibles at this elevation, but we did see a few. Um, so like most common edibles are kind of like oyster mushroom type things. Um, but like when you go really high in elevation, that's where you get all the edibles. Cause like for some reason, the cold uh, climates you know, favor really big mushrooms. The further down you go in elevation, the smaller the mushrooms get. So like sea level, the mushrooms are mostly tiny little things because it's so hot there that they like dry out really quick if they don't fruit right away. Um, but like, yeah, up by like Quito, you'll see like, you know, porcini and chanterelles and stuff like that. There's even some morels there. Uh, here's some some more glowing mushrooms. Um, these are kind of interesting because the stem was the part that glows most. So sometimes when you're finding mushrooms that glow in the dark, if a cap glows, sometimes the stem glows, sometimes it's just the mycelium, sometimes it's the whole thing. You know, the glowing stems. Here's some slime molds. And then this is a cordyceps type thing um, that grows on bat dung. This is just like bat dung that was on a stick. And then here is a cordyceps that grows on an ant. So at the bottom, you got a big carpenter ant and then it makes spores uh, growing out of here. And you can actually see the spores being released because they're these very thin 
kind of like very long needle-like spores. And then here is Ophiocordyceps amazonica, and it only grows on grasshoppers. And so, yeah, really cool thing. We found quite a few of these, but this was the most photogenic of them. And here's one that grows on weevils. And there's so many orchids in Ecuador. The orchids are epiphytic ones. So here we had a bunch of people holding the ultraviolet light so I could take ultraviolet photos of these orchids. Um, so in the ultraviolet light, the moss glows red and then the orchids are glowing blue. Ends up looking really cool. I want to question quick. Yeah. Do they have regulations on what you pick and what you can't? Um, what you can pick and what you can't. I like the orchids. Um, they do, and in general, you can't really pick anything with the, unless you have a permit. So it's it's pretty regulated, and so we were very lucky to be with a bunch of scientists that had permits and let let them pick anything. Um, but yeah, in general, you can you can't pick stuff. This was on private property, so it's a little bit different. You know, it's not like a public park. Um, but uh, so I don't, I don't really know what the regulations are like on private property for most people. But um, yeah, if in doubt, it's probably prohibited. Does that include mushrooms too? It does. Yeah, yeah. And really, anything from the wild. Yeah. You can probably pick mushrooms on private property to consume them there, but you probably cannot transport like mushrooms from private property, like on public roads. Do you need a transportation permit for that? Here is a Phaeoclavulina. Um, by Phaeoclavulina zipelii, so a little sapotrophic coral thing. And this is the craziest thing I found in the whole trip is a stinkhorn. So it's just a normal stinkhorn egg, but then there's this parasite coming out the side of it. And I talked to the world expert on stinkhorns, Larissa, who lives in Brazil. And she had never seen anything like it. So it's going to be really interesting to figure out what this parasite is. Um, but she invited me to Brazil next month for a fungus fair. So if you want to go to Brazil and go do a bunch of mushroom hunting, um, let me know. And I can like, let you know where this fungus fair is. It should be pretty cool. Lots of these little tiny kind of like oyster-like things. And then here's a lentinellus. This was growing on a banana leaf. And we ended up making clothing out of this. So if you go to my website, you can like order shirts that have uh, that pattern. Here is a pseudohydnum. So the common name is cat's tongue and the pseudohydnum in Ecuador are really tiny. Um, just really cool looking things. I always like to shine a bright light through them. And you can like just kind of see how translucent it is. Here's a pseudoscorpion. And pseudoscorpions are really tiny. This is a new species of pseudoscorpion and a new genus of pseudoscorpions that are found in the caves. Is was the scorpion uh, bioluminescent like most? No, it wasn't. Didn't do much with ultraviolet. And this is a psilocybe that I found um, kind of near a waterfall. And I'm not sure what psilocybe it is, section cordospore kind of growing on these like steep mossy walls near the waterfall. Um, here's another psilocybe that's common in Ecuador, psilocybe cirrolescens. This one was growing right in the parking lot of the eco reserve we were staying at. These really like the disturbed habitat. So if you're in the middle of the forest, you can hike all day, you won't see any of these. But if you're like right on the edge of the river or like on the edge of a road, um, they're not uncommon there. There's some of the some of the places we went, some rivers are really cool. And some of our friends. And there's a few scorpions there. All the scorpions are super fluorescent. And so, you know, with the black light it makes it re really easy to find these things. That miners use when they in caving, they go in to see their cloak and wear the black lights to see their. I'm from Mine Town. <laughs> oh, yeah. There's a lot of cool stuff that shows up in those lights. 
Uh, here's this little tiny mycenae that had a really slimy stem. So if you zoom way in, you can see like the this layer of slime. So these these little mycenae just grow like on the on the leaf litter. And then this I thought was some kind of crazy cordyceps. It's actually not fungal. It's just an insect um, that makes these crazy wax protrusions. And so I think the predators come along and they see this and they try to eat it, but the insect is actually really small and, and down at the base. And then that, the rest of it's just a distraction. Here's a lichen called coengenium. It's this nice green lichen that grows on sticks. And then after we um, after we finished with Furhas Place, we went to this remote research station called Sumac, and um, they have really cool like science lab and stuff there. But this is the guy that runs Sumac, and we didn't have a dehydrator to dry the mushrooms there, so he built us a dehydrator, which was super nice of him. And there's some more Trichlomopsis, and some of the rare flowers. This one smelled really nice. Oh, and here's our snake. So this snake is extremely uh, venomous. It's both drops by lineatus. And so it's one of the green vipers. And this is one of the things that I wanted to see when I went to Ecuador. And so I was very happy to see it. Um, you can see it's got the really nice triangular shaped head there. And so uh, this is basically like a fertilance, but a green version of the fertilance. So um, they're quite deadly. You can see the slit in the eye there. And they're very rarely on the ground. So you don't really have to watch your step for snakes in Ecuador, but these are sitting uh, three or four feet across uh, off the ground in trees. So you don't want to like, brush against too many bushes and trees at night. Though I'm running through the bushes and trees all night, every night, because I'm looking for bioluminescent mushrooms. But um, you have to be concerned about them striking from a tree. Oh, yeah, it's all coiled up. It's ready to go. Absolutely. Uh, I'm not too concerned about it, though, but. How close were you to when you took the picture? Way too close, uh, because the lens that I had was a 50 millimeter lens. So it's not, it's not like that zoomed into the lens. So I was way, way too, way, way too close for comfort. Uh, but if I die in the jungle, like hunting mushrooms, that's definitely a, a good, better way to go than many. It looks like he was smiling there. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> this one here is Merasmialis cubensis. So cubensis just means from Cuba. So it was discovered there. It has this kind of cool vulva at the base of the stem. And there are so many species of Xylaria in, in Ecuador. Um, just tons and tons of crazy Xylaria. That's just one of them. Really good frogs. And then here's another Psilocybe. This one is Psilocybe youngensis. Psilocybe youngensis is named after the youngest region of Bolivia. Um, but I find it quite often in Mexico. And this one has a really thin cap. So like if you're kind of like looking up at the sky through the cap, you can like see the sky behind, you know, through the cap. It's just a, a really thin one. Uh, but it has the purple spores. And, and then here is Psilocybe zapaticorum. So Psilocybe zapaticorum is the world's most potent psilocybin mushroom, uh, at least the most potent wild one. And you can see that it um, grows in big clusters. This is a landslide, so it's really difficult to take this picture because like, the landslide is extremely unstable and <laughs> extremely steep and extremely rocky. Um, but you, know, you go there and you find really interesting mushrooms. And these mushrooms don't really grow in undisturbed areas very often at all. So you can walk through the woods for months and not see any of these, but you go along the base of the landslide and sometimes you see 10,000 of them. Zapaticorum is closely related to Paralysis, right? No, so Psilocybe zapaticorum is in section zapaticorum. And in section zapaticorum, you have like Psilocybe auclandiae and um, a few others, like Carolensis, uh, other species are a lot, probably Psilocybe malericula is its closest relative, and Subtropicalis, known as uh, Huchgenia varconvexa. But um, the Carolensis is closely related to Psilocybe mexicana, so it's a completely oh, okay. different clade of okay, Psilocybe. Um, one thing I'm doing is DNA barcoding on all of these rare Psilocybes. And I'm doing that on several different genes so I can build like a family tree that's really accurate and figure out how they all evolve. 
they rare? Not particularly. Um, if the forest is in really good shape and it's really healthy, then yes, they're extremely rare. But when humans come in and they like screw up the environment and build roads and stuff, all of a sudden they're very common along the disturbance. So they're kind of like the first mushrooms that come in when the earth is all mixed, messed up and they um, you know, turn like the leaf litter back into good soil. And so you know, they could be used for microremediation or maybe it's like the jungle's natural healing. Um, so a lot of times we'll find like 50 pounds of these things and we'll just take them and throw them all over like landslides and just like places that got really screwed up by humans and just to help it you know, remediate the, the damage. Um, Salasomy zapatocorum is one of my favorite ones to photograph because it has this stem. Um, you can see like the blue staining on here, but it has the really cool squamules all over the stem. And they stain very blue. Like this is like indigo, almost black. And um, they can be really big. These things can be a foot tall. So, yeah. And I think that's why the natives in South America have been using psilocybin mushrooms for thousands of years. And the natives in Washington, as far as we know, had not discovered them. And that's because the psilocybin mushrooms in Washington are little brown mushrooms. And if you go around eating all the little brown mushrooms, you'd probably get poisoned before you find these things. But these psilocybes get real big. They don't smell bad. They don't taste bad. So they probably you know, figured they would make a good dinner. And um, you know, like some of the several lessons, they'll grow in massive clusters. You could definitely um, harvest that for dinner. And then they got a big surprise, and they're like, "Wait, that's that's medicine," and they just started using them. Yeah, might they rinse them like people in Europe do with uh, the amanitas? Um, what's that? Rinsing them or washing them, like uh, Daniel Winkler's book talks about. Well, I think the you know the drug in the amanita is very different. Um, water soluble though. They're both water soluble. Yeah, so they can make tea out of amanitas or or the psilocybe. Yeah, five minutes. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I think I think it's pr pretty close to done. Then I think we'll have a little bit of time for questions. Uh, some zapatocorum, and I think that was actually our last slide. Yeah, because there was an al alphabetical order. And zapatocorum is at the end. Okay. All right, we got five minutes for questions. If anyone has any. Okay, tell you about stacking. That's a good idea. Um, so image stacking is a technique that I use and I use it on all of my photos because I've been taking pictures of mushrooms for 20 years, but I was never very happy with how my mushroom photography turned out until I started image stacking. But basically what you do is you take a lot of pictures and then by combining them, you can bend the laws of physics. And by that, I mean, you can have infinite depth of field. So you can have as much depth of field as you want. And you can shoot with your aperture wide open, and that makes your background very blurry. So you have a very sharp subject with a very blurry background, and it really draws the person's eye to the, uh, to the mushroom, um, to the subject. And mushrooms work really well. Let's see. Ah, oh, looks like we were only, we got to share again, to share the whole screen, Let's see if this works. Uh, mushrooms work really well for image stacking. And the reason is because uh, mushrooms are not moving. So like when the plants are blowing in the wind, you can't image stack something that's moving. But if the mushrooms are still, then, um, then you can take a lot of pictures and combine them all. So I'll just take one of these here. Um, here's one that I found at Bridal Trails in Redmond a couple days ago. And this is Mycena organensis. And so this is the first photo in my stack. What's in focus is just this part of the stick down here. So I try to focus, um, like I, I focus on the mushrooms and then I pull the focus back closer. So everything is blurry because um, it's focused too close. So that is the first one in the stack. And then if I go back down here for each, each uh, subsequent picture, they are focused further back. And so in this one, uh, only the very back of the twig is in focus. Um, and so this is, Looks like it's, a, it's just like the perfect amount of pictures. And so I'm in Adobe Bridge here, which is just a photo, um, photo viewer, plain old photo viewer. But what I do is I select all of those and I bring those into Helicon. So this is Helicon Focus over here. And so I just drag those in. 
And that was 35 pictures. So this will be a stack of 35 images. And now I have different methods. These are different algorithms I can use. Uh, overall, I like method C. Um, although method A gives the best background, so sometimes I'll combine the methods. But here, uh, if you look at the window on the right, you can start to see the image being constructed. So it's just taking the sharpest parts of those 35 images and giving me a final output image. Um, so you can see that these are razor sharp and you can zoom way in and see all the details and everything. And I can combine as many images as I want so I can have as much depth of field as I want and the background is nice and blurry. And um, then from here, I'll just save this and load it into Photoshop and adjust um, all of the settings in Photoshop until it looks on my screen just like it looked out in the field. And then I am done. So to take a stacked image, I use a feature called focus shift shooting in my camera. And what it does is it takes a picture and then it changes the focus and it takes another picture and changes the focus. And it just does that as many times as I tell it. So it usually takes me about 10 seconds to set, you know, to actually take the pictures. And then um, you know, it takes, you know, maybe a minute of uh, computer work here and like another minute in Photoshop. So total probably takes like three minutes to take one picture but it's totally worth it for just like how the pictures come out and how well you can see the mushrooms. And you know, like send people a picture like this, it really stands out and they're gonna be like, wow, this is like the coolest thing I've ever seen. So it really gets people interested in mushrooms um, really easily. And I think the more people we can get interested in mushrooms, the more people there will be out there that wanna conserve our wild biodiversity. We got time for like one more question. Mm -hmm. Ask about your tripod then. What kind of tripod do you use to keep that from coming while you're doing all this? Oh, I carry like this carbon fiber tripod. It's um, it's it's a regular tripod, but one thing about it is that it does not have a center pole because um, mushroom photos look really good when the camera is near the ground. So without a center pole, the legs can like go out all the way, and the, the camera can be sitting almost on the ground. But very often, especially for tiny mushrooms, I don't use a tripod. I will just sit the camera directly on the ground or I'll sit it on a little bean bag. Sometimes I'll even like dig a little hole in the mud and then stick my camera down in the mud. So it's like pointing up at the mushroom. Um, but yeah, it's definitely important for this to have the camera very still. Yeah. So um, yeah, whatever you do, the camera can't be moving, but mushrooms look awesome. You just throw the camera directly on the ground and just have it take pictures there. I'll say one last thing about image stacking, and that is that it took me many years to learn to take good pictures of mushrooms because I had to like do the ISO and the depth of field and everything like that. But with image stacking, even someone who's very new to photography can take pictures that are every bit as good as any of my pictures because it's much easier. You just take the camera, throw it there, start it stacking and combine them. You don't have to worry about aperture. You don't have to worry about ISO. You don't have to worry about depth of field. All of those things are taken care of by the stacking process. So any, someone who is very new at photography, um, like I can teach somebody that has a nice camera how to take photos like this you know, easily in an afternoon and then their pictures will be every bit as good as mine are. Whereas if people have like, you're doing like an old type of photography where you gotta do all these settings, it would take years to learn how to take like a really nice picture. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, on behalf of the Kitsap Peninsula Mycological Society, we want to award the Certificate of Appreciation <laughs> to College of Environmental We still need to sign it. Okay. So. Also, Alan, is it possible for yeah. us to use your uh, black light to see if any of the mushrooms are dry? Oh, that's a great idea. Yeah, we should definitely do that. I think I set it down somewhere not too far away. Right here. Yeah. So a uh, cool thing about black lights is that some of the fluorescence is extremely bright. So like, uh, yeah, it helps if it's a little bit darker, but even in like the middle of the day, you can see the fluorescence pretty well. And, you know, some mushrooms much more so than others, but it's always fun to run the black light around the, like a quarry table. And the best part, part is usually the rusilus. So like, I love this electric blue color that's on the top and then the gills bright yellow. And you can capture these kind of colors really easily and really well with a cell phone at night. So all you need is a black light, 
cell phone. Oh, yeah. 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 so this is Hypolemma fasciculari, Selfertuff. It's one of the most fluorescent mushrooms, and they are just ridiculously wow. bright. You can see it from 100 meters away. Like these light up as bright as a scorpion does. And then, some, you know, some of them not at all, but you get every color in the rainbow from ultraviolet light. So, you know, the bioluminescent mushrooms that glow in the dark, they're only green, but black light can give you, black light fluorescence can give you really any color. So I'll leave this here for people. Oh, how much it was set to uh, $30. Yeah, so I'll, I'll just ask me and I will send you a link um, off of Amazon to get a really good one. I think the one that I like to recommend now, I think it's 34 bucks and it comes like the next day. Well, that was recommended by our identifier last year to have them for this year's show. I was oh, yeah. it's really fun to walk around the woods at night. We've got a different dimension, everything's so different. Here. Oh yeah, so this one I gave out the one that I can 